Hey guys, we're back today with another video. Um, this video is going to be on the discovery of the unconscious by Henry Ellenberger. And basically this book talks about the development of how modern day psychiatry actually came to be. Um, there's quite a bit of information in this book and I'm very excited to jump into it with you guys. Um, so let's go ahead and start with the ancestry of dynamic psychotherapy. Long before the advent of modern psychiatric practices, we can track man's attempt to contend with illness of the mind. These ancient roots can be found in the form of medicine men and shamans of primitive man. At first, these primitive practices seem to be the result of strange rituals connected with an ancient belief system. However, in the wake of modern day discoveries in the field of psychiatry, we can view these ancient practices in a new light. If we track the evolution of psychiatry back to its roots, we can see how the shamanic rituals of the distant past were man's attempt at a form of primitive psychotherapy. One of the first people to view these primitive practices in this new light was the German anthropologist Adolf Bastian. While doing field work in Guyana, Bastian contracted a fever and had to be treated by a local medicine man. During the ceremony, he was put in a hammock and told to lay perfectly still. Tobacco leaves were put in a bowl of water and the medicine man conjured up demons and spirits called Kenimas. These spirits manifested in the form of noises and voices that gradually grew louder and louder. Eventually, Bastian fell into a deep hypnotic sleep. The ritual lasted for six hours. At the end, after waking up from his sleep, the medicine man placed his hand on Bastian's face. He then showed him a caterpillar which he had allegedly pulled from his forehead and claimed that it was the source of his illness. Now, Bastian did not actually believe he was cured, but he did realize the value in studying these primitive rituals that were rapidly disappearing in the ever-advancing world. Many studies of these primitive rituals were done, and the common forms of treatment included extraction of a disease object, such as the caterpillar, to find, bring back, and restore a lost soul, exorcism, mechanical extraction of a foreign spirit, transferring a foreign spirit into another living being, the process of confession, and counter magic. As these rituals became better known, the psychiatrists of that time became interested in comparing the primitive view of these symptoms with their patients who were exhibiting severe hysterical symptoms and attempted to explain these primitive illnesses and ritualistic cures in psychological terms. The ancient concept of disease being caused by the soul leaving or being stolen from the body can be traced back to primitive cultures all over the world. The common thread among all these primitive beliefs concerning the soul disease is that within man there is a ghost-like soul and that its presence is essential for one to live a normal life. In his classic book, Taboo and the Perils of the Soul, the Scottish anthropologist James Fraser says, The soul of the sleeper is supposed to wander away from his body and actually visit the places, see the persons, and perform the acts of which he dreams. During the period in which the soul leaves the body, it could become lost or meet accidents or dangers of all kind and become trapped outside of the body. To treat the disease, the shaman would use their secret techniques to work themselves up into a state of ecstasy where their soul could leave their body and enter the world of the spirits to help the lost soul find its way back to the body. At first glance, these ancient techniques seem strange to say the least. But if we ignore the cultural element and seek only the essence of the facts, we may find some common ground between their primitive beliefs and our more modern ones. After all, couldn't we describe our mental patients as alienated or estranged from themselves, where their ego is damaged or destroyed? The therapist could be seen as the modern version of the shaman. 
Instead of searching for a lost soul, they are searching for the healthy part of the mind that has been lost or overwhelmed by the diseased part of the mind. And in psychotherapy, they attempt to bring the healthy part of the mind back into consciousness. In the case of the extracted disease object mentioned earlier, we can only make sense of this cure by first understanding that the patient believes in the powers of the shaman. Having established that, we can see how this is a similar phenomena to the transference neurosis, in which the patient exhibiting neurotic symptoms as a result of a childhood trauma learns to trust the therapist who then becomes the object they transfer their childlike feelings onto. By working out their issues with the therapist as a stand-in for whoever the childhood conflicts were with so they can overcome their neurotic symptoms. In the case of the shaman, the disease object and the power of the shaman are a stand-in for the actual illness. Exorcism and possession is considered a more typical root of modern day psychiatry and is still practiced in several countries today. With possession, an individual seems to lose their identity and become another person. This can happen in two ways. The somnambulic type, where the individual has no recollection of the possession, and the lucid type, where the individual is aware that the possession is happening. To cure possession, the exorcist must first lure the foreign spirit to take control of the body and then cast it out, usually in the name of a higher being usually a god who they themselves strongly believe in. There has been countless accounts of exorcism throughout the ages, but perhaps the most studied case is that of Godalbin Didas and the Reverend Blumhart. Due to it being so well documented and having taken place relatively recently in the years of 1842 to 1843, Didas was a 28-year-old woman who had lost both of her parents as a child. She began having visions of a woman who had died two years before. The neighbors reported the house was haunted and that they could hear strange and terrifying noises from it at night. This was later confirmed by the local physician and several witnesses. Blumhart was called in and he had her moved from the house. The house ceased to be haunted, but Didis remained possessed. She would have violent convulsions and spoke in the voice of the dead woman. The reverend spoke with the spirit which claimed to be multiple demons. After a long struggle, the demons fled from the body of Didis and took possession of her younger sister. The sister was even worse off and after a desperate struggle, Blumhart was finally able to free her from the spirits. Now this case has some striking similarities to the psychotherapy of severe schizophrenics. Blumhart conversed with the demons and got to know them much like how the therapist explores the inner world of the schizophrenic's delusions. Less than 50 years later, these type of possessions would have been admitted into a psychiatric hospital and treated for hysteria. It's an actual fact that there have been cases of psychogenic death in primitive people as a result of violating some kind of taboo. It has been documented by multiple reliable sources. Many primitive populations believe that certain diseases result from the violation of taboo. The treatment for these diseases in many areas is confession of the breach of taboo, which is the primitive equivalent of sin. Many religions believe that disease could be a punishment for sinning and violating moral and religious laws. Religious confession was a way to achieve relief and often cures of the symptoms. This concept still exists today. Although psychiatry has abandoned the term sin, the concept has been replaced with the term guilt feeling and can lead to psychological and physical illness. For centuries, physicians have believed that the frustration caused by unfulfilled wishes could cause illness. This is where we get the terms homesick and lovesick from. The logical form of treatment is to fulfill the wish. However, depending on the wish, that was not always possible. Primitive man's solution to this problem was ceremonial healing. Take for example someone who is frustrated by their unfulfilled life and wishes to be recognized by their peers. The Bilo of Madagascar dresses the patient in extravagant clothes 
and has a ceremony where they coronate them and treat them like a king for 15 days. The patient's self-confidence is inflated and the ceremonial healing is very often successful. Another form of ceremonial healing calls for the patient to act out the traumatizing event that caused their illness. Today we would call this psychodrama. There are many references to states of hypnotic sleep in primitive medicine. The primitive practice of hypnotism that most closely resembles our modern hypnotic procedure was found in an Egyptian scroll dating back to the 3rd century AD. In it, they talk of a young boy who was put into a trance using a luminous object. They then recorded everything he saw and heard in his clairvoyant hypnotic trance. Belief in magic is universal among primitive populations, and many of the procedures we have already mentioned would fall into this category. In some instances, they believe that some form of black magic is the cause of the illness, and so the cure the medicine man attempts could be considered counter magic. In other instances, the illness could be of natural causes and the cure itself is of a magical nature. Now this may sound like an irrational fantasy, but we must keep in mind that the primitive medicine men and shamans dealt with primarily severe and extraordinary cases that their more conventional healers were unable to cure. Some of the primitive healing techniques used to treat ordinary physical illnesses were surprisingly sophisticated. Many of their herbal medicines were later synthesized into modern day pharmaceuticals. In some instances, they even had treatments for mental illnesses that did not rely on magic or spiritual healing. The ethnologist Jay Kvigstad reported a case of a native healer in Lapland who prescribed a routine to their patient that included abstaining from all alcohol, tobacco, and coffee, rising early and keeping busy with work. He said he should be monitored and if he became aggressive, put into an empty room until they calmed down. And if they tried to attack someone, they should be smacked on their naked skin with a leafless twig and reprimanded sharply. This native healer reportedly cured many mental illnesses with this primitive form of therapy. We have pointed out many of the similarities between primitive and modern medicine. However, we should note some of the major differences. The first being that the medicine man was a much more important figure in the community than the modern day physician. On top of this, the patients trusted in the power of the medicine man themselves rather than the medication or treatment prescribed such as we do in today's day and age. The primitive shamans also went through what could be called an initiatory illness. Sometimes they were prone to this illness naturally, and other times it was induced with drugs or fasting. In both cases, the shaman was subject to severe mental illness and became a healer only once they had overcome their own illness. In primitive societies, the difference between mind and body is not as clearly defined as it is today. Even when treating a physical illness of the body, most of their cures centered in the mind. And finally, primitive healings were almost always done publicly in a large group of the patient's peers. Today, treatment is done privately and a patient's privacy is protected by law. Thus far, we have covered the most ancient roots of what today is psychotherapy. Some of the rituals just mentioned date back to more than 200,000 years ago. It wasn't until about 6,000 years ago that civilizations as we know them today started to appear. These ancient civilizations laid the groundwork for forming organized religion and creating systematized bodies of knowledge that would one day evolve into science. During this time period, the primitive lay healers became much more proficient at treating physical ailments, but could do little for emotional conditions. Patients would seek out priests in their ancient temples for spiritual healing in these cases. This is also where we see the first instances of highly developed techniques for mental training like yoga and Zen Buddhism. In the Greco-Roman period, the rise of philosophy created various schools of thought and psychic training. 
It is well established that modern day psychology has its roots in philosophy and we can see aspects of stoicism in existentialism and the works of Alfred Adler. Some characteristics of Plato's academy can be found in analytical psychology founded by Carl Jung, whereas Epicurus's philosophy aimed at removing anxiety and is comparable with Sigmund Freud's psychoanalysis. The next major phase in the evolution of psychotherapy came with the rise of the Catholic Church. The renewed emphasis on the importance of confession influenced the development of psychology. The Catholic autobiography of St. Augustine's Confession reads like a psychological novel. The priests attempted to systematize their knowledge of psychology in their texts on moral theology. Much later, after the Protestant Reformation, the Protestant communities abolished confession. However, a new tradition rose up commonly referred to as the cure of souls. This process not only involved the patient confessing their secret that was the source of their illness, but the priest would also be actively involved in coming up with solution to the patient's distressing problems which is reminiscent of present-day short-term psychotherapy. Eventually, over time, this process of confessing the pathogenic secret passed from the clergy to laymen. When this happened exactly is unknown, but some of the earliest accounts of this transition were of the early magnetists whom we will discuss in more detail in the next video. This magnetizer movement became popular in France after Amin Marie Jacques de Chastenet, Marquis de Pusiger, discovered how to induce a state of magnetic sleep which was later called hypnosis. In 1784, Pusiger's first patient, Victor Race, was put into a state of magnetic sleep where he was able to reveal a secret of a terrible conflict with his sister that he would have never been able to bring himself to share in his normal state. Pusiker gave Race advice while in his magnetic sleep, which he followed during his normal state, which led to the conflict's resolution, and his recovery from the mental illness it was causing. Similar cases such as this were reported everywhere during this early period of magnetism. The practice of magnetism became much less frequent in the second half of the 19th century, but in the 1880s and 1890s there were still plenty of hypnotists using this same kind of treatment. The first medical professional that recognized the pathogenic secret and its psychotherapeutic treatment was the Viennese physician Moritz Benedict. He published a series of cases between the years of 1864 and 1895 showing that many cases of hysteria and other neuroses could be caused by a pathogenic secret, mostly pertaining to their sex life, and that many patients could be cured by the process of confession and working it out the issues. These discoveries carried over into the birth of modern dynamic psychiatry. Pierre Jeannette and Sigmund Freud both discovered cases of hysteria caused by unconscious pathogenic secrets. As Freud developed his psychoanalysis, this concept was gradually absorbed into the terms repression and neurotic guilt feelings. Of all the early pioneers of dynamic psychiatry, Carl Jung devoted the most attention to the pathogenic secret. Perhaps because his father was a Protestant minister and so was familiar with the cure of souls previously mentioned. At the end of the 16th century and during the 17th century, we were introduced into a new era with the birth of modern science. Earlier forms of science relied on observation and deduction, which is something closer to philosophy, whereas modern science relied on experimentation and measurement. Medicine became a branch of science, psychiatry a branch of medicine, and psychotherapy an application of psychiatry based on scientific findings. Historically, modern dynamic psychotherapy derives from primitive medicine and we can see the uninterrupted evolution from exorcism to magnetism, magnetism to hypnotism, and from hypnotism to the modern schools of dynamic psychiatry. 
We will continue to track this evolution through the 19th century and up through the turn of the 20th century in the upcoming videos by taking an in-depth look at the work of men like Jean-Martin Charcot, Pierre Jeannette, and Sigmund Freud.